Here's a lovely new diagram of the Great Tree of Life. It's by uh, Leonard Eisenberg, and you can get it at this website if you're interested. Um, what we see here, uh, as we go radially, we get time. So this is, this is the beginning of life on the planet. And it starts with bacteria and archaea, and then we get the eukaryotes. And everything from here over is a eukaryote. All of this diversity of life. Basically, to a first approximation, every living thing that you can see with a naked eye is a eukaryote. And here, by the way, there's the famous Cambrian explosion when we get this sudden increase in diversity, sudden over several million years, over several tens of millions of years. And way over here, maybe, maybe right there, that's the, that's the division of us from the chimpanzee. Now, yeah, see it a little closer. Uh, all of that, that fan out of life is due to the eukaryotic revolution, a major transition indeed. What happened? It happened about two and a half billion years ago. And here's what happened. There were only simple cells, even simpler than an amoeba, because it's a eukaryote. And they were just living there for a billion years or so. And then one day, prokaryote A and prokaryote B came together, and A engulfed B, or B invaded A. Well, which was it? Did A eat B, or did B invade A? When you're a prokaryote, it isn't so clear. Uh, basically, if, you, if A takes B apart and uses the parts, A is eating B, and throwing away all the design or most of the design in the process. If B does the same to A from the inside, the same thing. But what if neither one breaks the other up and they join forces? This is what happened, and it only had to happen once. And it created a single thing, a eukaryotic cell. The result was a more complicated cell that was fitter. And the rest is history. Lynn Margulis, my friend and uh, not quite colleague down the road at University of Massachusetts, is the scientist who's most responsible for getting this into the textbook. She didn't invent the idea, but she's the one who fought for it and fought well. And we can see at a glance in this simple diagram what happened. On the left we have a, we have, whoop, oh, push the wrong button. Uh, on, on the left we have a prokaryote, relatively simple. On the right, it's like, it's like a jackknife with more blades. There's just many more moving parts. There's a whole lot more complexity, and that's what's important here. By the way, uh, for those of you uh, uh, who, who've heard about this, there's the mitochondria, and, and they have their own genome. That is the best evidence that this is how this happened, the so-called endosymbiotic origins of the eukaryotic cell, is that Every cell in your body, every human cell in your body has both its nuclear DNA and its mitochondrial DNA, which your mitochondria are the direct descendants, the direct descendants of that original engulfee at the birth of the, of the uh, eukaryotic revolution. Now, as I said, eukaryotes are more talented, more versatile. That's what makes multicellular life, visible life, possible. Now, why do I talk about that instead of just language and human culture? Because I want to show the, the, that there's something very similar happened in one species so far on this planet with the invention of language and human culture. In other words, we're getting now to the point of my slide with the picture. What happened is that human culture came on the scene and suddenly, Individuals got the benefit of all the R&D, all the research and development that had been done by non-relatives for a long period. You think about it, when, when that first eukaryotic union happened, you have two relatively independent entities. They have evolved for a billion years in slightly different environments. When they come together, they get the benefit of a billion years of R&D in, in a twinkling. They don't have to do it for themselves. Of course, if A takes B apart, 
all bets are off. It's throwing away all that design work and just using the energy, just using the raw materials. Similarly, when we invented, when, when culture was invented, and we really didn't invent it, when language evolved, suddenly individuals could acquire stupendous amounts of design that they didn't have to do themselves the hard way. It was the great influx of design which set off the cultural revolution. Now, tradition maybe would say that culture is a divine gift. Different, different religions have different stories about how, how human beings got language or culture. Another story, slowly, slightly less mythical, is that it's all the product of human genius. You know, who, who invented language? Well, there was this really clever woman way back when she invented language. Her brother invented the wheel. And, you know. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We know that that's not true. But it leads to the view that over the centuries, intelligent human designers created cultural treasures which were then valued and preserved and passed on. Uh, we can call this the inherited treasures model of cultural evolution. It is, it is pretty much the prevailing wisdom in, in the humanities and the social sciences and in human culture generally. In other words, the culture is composed of good things, treasures, that were invented by innovators with insight and then recognized and valued as such by adopters who transmit and tinker. In other words, what we have here is an economic model of possessions. These are the possessions of the culture, or of the people within that culture. There's one problem with this prevailing wisdom. Here are some, here are some treasures who invented words, or arithmetic, or music, or maps, or money, and the answer is nobody. Nobody invented these. It's not that we don't know who invented them, it's that nobody invented them. They evolved by natural selection. Not genetic natural selection, cultural natural selection. Just the way animals and plants and viruses do. It's important to remember viruses because by most people's definitions, viruses are not alive. They're just large macromolecules. They are, as I like to say, a string of nucleic acid with attitude. <laughs> they have this weird property that they provoke their own replication and they travel light. They don't have their own copying machinery. They exploit the copying machinery of others. And they don't, again, remember, competence without comprehension. They have no clue what they're doing. If, if, if an amoeba is clueless, a virus is even more clueless. But they do have competence. Stunning, evolved competence. You don't have to be alive to have competence. Natural selection can work on anything that replicates differentially, that competes for space in the replication tournaments. Words are my favorite example of this. They are, I think, clearly the most important cultural items. Without words, human culture would be like chimpanzee culture, almost non-existent. We know that there are hundreds of thousands of words. Where do they all come from? Well, from thousands of languages, many of which are going extinct and will, in another 50 years, we may only number the languages in the dozens or hundreds. Could they have had a common ancestor? Yeah, they could have. In fact, if this is the phylogenetic tree, the great tree of life, we also have glossogenetic trees, which are the, which are the trees, the lineages of languages. Here are the Proto-Indo-European languages. Here are the Finno-Ugric languages, the languages of China, Proto-Mayan languages. I just went to websites and grabbed all these nice glossogenetic trees to show you that a lot of work has been done to work out the, the genealogy, if you like, the, the, the lineages of languages. And some of this work was done long before Darwin. In fact, Darwin was himself somewhat inspired by work of 19th century uh, 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 students of, of language evolution. 